Lord God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being so good, oh God. You are good. You are good. You are good. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Yes, all the time. He is good. Let's praise and worship our living God. This is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, you are good, oh God. Oh, hallelujah.
worship God in spirit and in truth. Oh, oh. 
Good morning and welcome again to our online Sunday worship service. We thank God for this wonderful occasion that we can be together, Lord, as a family of God to honor, worship, and serve our living God. Now let's commit this service to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much again for this wonderful time that as your people, God, and as your family, we are gathered, Lord, to honor and to worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Father God, I pray that your anointing be upon us, O Lord, and that the Holy Spirit will guide us and teach us once again this morning. Thank you, God, and we give you back the praises, the glory, the honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Praise God. Now, let us read Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 for our scripture text, you know, for today's message. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. You know, my garage and front yard improvement project is still going on. Before I started, I prayed for several months that God would send me masons and carpenters that are really good. And you know what? He answered me, you know, in a mysterious way. I thank God for that glory to God. Now, the project is almost done now, and I'm so happy with the result of the work. One thing I noticed, though, on top of their being skillful carpenters and masons, are their passion in, you know, in, in doing the work. They are not doing the work for the sake of doing it for a living. They love what they're doing. They joke and laugh around all the time while their hands are busy with what they're working on. I can also help but notice their right attitude as I interact and, you know, mingle with them. And I'm so thankful to God for sending them to me to help me with my project. Now, their attitude as they work and their passion and what they're doing, you know, inspired me to prepare this message today about worship with passion. Worship with passion is pleasing, acceptable to God, and brings glory to His name. Now, Reading from our text, God was speaking to His people through the prophet Isaiah that His people's worship was not acceptable and pleasing to Him. God, who knows the hearts of, and minds of His people, rebuked them by saying that they only honor Him with their mouth and lips, but their hearts are far from Him. You know, their worship is based merely on human rules they have been taught. They become so legalistic and ritualistic, and they become plastic, huh? We can be so accustomed to a ceremonial approach to worship that it becomes mechanical without the heart to worship, without passion, you know, to worship God. And this is what God said, you know, to the Israelites, your hearts are far from me. You see, in true worship, God is not just, you know, concerned about the quality of our voice or, you know, the genre of the songs we sing or, or, or whatever, but the condition of the heart, right? It is, you know, a heart worship. The definition of worship is faulty. Therefore, you know, worship is also, the expression of worship is also faulty, you know, as a pastor, I'm praying and desiring that we will all grow in the area of expressing worship to God with passion, a kind of worship that pleases God to be a true worshiper that the Father is seeking nowadays. Now, expressing heartfelt worship, amen. I believe that for us to have a heartfelt worship, we need to have a clear you know, and biblical definition of worship in our minds. Because how you personally define worship will influence the way you worship, right? How worship is defined comes from, of course, different sources. Like, for example, you know, it's a, you know, you have your own personal definition. Perhaps <clears throat> your personal definition of worship is, you know, defined by religious tradition. For example, the Samaritan woman, she said that their ancestors taught them to worship in a particular or designated place, and no other place is acceptable as a place of worship. 
Again, you know, the Pharisees and other religious groups during the time of Christ define worship based on their religious laws. You cannot worship outside, you know, what they believe is the law. And it can also be defined by your own faulty interpretation of the Bible. You know, some Christians believe that you, know, you can worship anywhere and anytime without the need to go to church. Therefore, the church to them is irrelevant. You know, it is true that you can worship God anywhere and anytime, but to me, that is only half truth. Because from the Old Testament and the New Testament, you will find that they have designated places of worship and designated time to congregate you know, for worship. First, they have the tabernacle right, in the Old Testament, then the temple, and in the New Testament, after the birth of the church in the book of Acts, they go from house to house to worship, and finally, the synagogue that is scattered all over Judah, Samaria, and Galilee. This is a place where the Jews congregate to worship and hear God's word. In fact, we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, you know, we are encouraged there not to give up, meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. In fact, all the more because we know that the day is approaching. You know, worship could also be defined by professional worship leaders, you know what I mean? You know, and worship concerts. And sometimes they set a standard of what worship is. And if we fail to copy the worship style, we feel we have not worshipped God the way they do. And worship can also be defined by religious denominations. You know, every denomination has its own definition and expression of worship. But I believe that no denomination can claim that their worship or that the worship style of worship is the universal standard for worship, right? And furthermore, it can also be defined by your personality and personal taste. And one of the problem with this personality-based worship is that it becomes self-centered. You know, I will worship God the way I like to worship God. It is more of the flesh and not of the spirit. I believe we cannot have one standard definition of worship, but studying the etymology of the word worship from its original language can give us a uniform meaning, implication, intention, and understanding of the essence of worship. Now, the word etymology is the study of individual word, discovering its original meaning and intention from its original language. Now, the New Testament is written, you know, in Greek language, right? And the word worship in Greek language is, you know, called proskoneo. And the word literally means to kiss to word. It is use of the ancient tradition of a person kissing the hand of a superior. A person would bow the head and kiss the hand of one who was superior to him. It was also used in the sense of bowing down or prostrating oneself. A person would bow down before superior with a sense of honor, respect, or reverence and homage. And the person who does proskuneo understands you know, from the heart this concept. Therefore, when we worship God, we must come before Him with His image in mind. And it simply means that we have humbled ourselves and give glory, honor, reverence, all respect and homage to God. It means that we recognize His vastly superior standing and we humble ourselves before Him and give glory to God. Amen. Now, in English grammar, the word worship is both a noun and a verb. As a noun, you may have the definition of the word. As a verb, you have the action of the word. Therefore, you know, to, to be a true worshiper, your right definition of worship must be acted upon. And worship is not only to be properly defined, but also properly expressed, acted upon individually and corporately. For one to have a proper definition of, uh, and proper expression of worship, one must be born again. I think I, I, I'm aiming for that. One must be born again. You cannot be a true worshiper unless you're born again. You cannot have a proper definition and expression of worship unless you're born again. And Jesus said in John 3 verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now the prerequisite 
to be a subject in the kingdom of God is to be born again, right? To be born again is not experienced by being a member of a certain Christian denomination. Because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a religious man. He considered himself a worshiper. He was devoted, you know, to the law and practices it every single day. But yet he asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life and doesn't understand how to be born again. He fits to the same people that Isaiah spoke about who worship God with their mouth and lips, yet their hearts are far from Him. You know, your born again experience will open the door to a deeper relationship with God through worship. Now your body, soul, and spirit are now made alive. And these faculties now become the avenue of your worship expression. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, for proper definition and expression of worship, one must understand that it is a spiritual activity. Not just a physical activity, but mainly it is a spiritual activity. A deep expression of the human spirit. You know, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, Worship Him in spirit and in truth, right? Before you were born again, your spirit is dead. Our spirit is dead because of sin. You cannot understand the things of God like Jesus said to Nicodemus, I have spoken to you earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things, right? When you worship in the spirit, it goes beyond rules and regulations taught by men. It goes beyond your personality, you know, and personal taste. Without the movement of the Holy Spirit in your worship, it becomes ritual and ceremonial. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes our worship powerful. Praise God. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, they will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by people like that. You know, from the New Living Translation, let's read again 2 Timothy. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that without the activity of the Holy Spirit and worship. It will end up a religious act. Just go to church on only a form of godliness, but you lack the, prop, the power thereof. Now, for proper definition and expression of worship, one must study the Bible, right? Because it is all in the Bible. Worship is taught in the Bible. Every page in the Bible teaches about how we worship the Lord. Again, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, worship Him in spirit and in truth, right? The truth is recorded in the Bible, right? You know, as we study the Bible, we discover truth for Christian living. The truth about worship is in the pages of the Bible. The expression of worship, you know, is the overflow of the truth in your life. Hallelujah. The deeper you grow, you know, in the truth about God, the deeper is the expression of proskuneo in your life. Yes, amen, hallelujah. You know, let me share to you a different expression of worship this morning. Now, there is what I call the worship of repentance. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, you know, then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate, right? You know, I guess you know the story about uh, the, the sin of David the Bathsheba. You know, it bore them a son, but then out of punishment, God struck the child and finally the child died and that really caused pain you know, in David's heart. He fasted while the son was still alive and sickly, but after the son died, you know, he rose up and went to the house of God to worship. Uh, there is also a worship of submission, like in Job chapter 1, verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. 
Now, you know, again, the story of Job is in chapter 1, you know. Uh, the, the Job experienced tragedy and calamities, you know, with his properties and his family and his children died. And they come one after another. Upon hearing this, you know, then we see that Job worshipped the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So this is, you know, a worship of submission. Job submitted himself, you know, as he go through this hardship in the hands of the Lord. And he demonstrated that. In a form of worship. There is also what I call there is a worship of devotion. In Genesis chapter 22 verse 5, he said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Again, this is Abraham when he obeyed God to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering, you know, in Mount Moriah. He went in obedience to God. But he said, no, he came there, you know, to worship the Lord. Now, did you notice that in each of these three events, uh, the flesh and its desire were set aside, right? The worshiper must, uh, is more interested in doing the will of the Lord from the heart than in gratifying the flesh. And that is the true essence of spiritual worship. It comes from the spirit of man and ascends to God. It ascribes worth too, in spite of personal feelings, fleshly ambitions, or personal desires. It has the glory of God as its highest aim. Amen. We worship God to bring glory to God. You know, excuse me. I believe our personal expression of worship becomes heartfelt. You know, when we understand the essence of worship. Now, Again, the substance of worship is embedded in the word worship. While I was really pondering and studying and seeking the mind of the Lord, and I thought, you know, uh, the seven, uh, what do you call the essence or meaning of worship, you know, is in the word worship itself. The word worship has seven letters, and each letter stands for something we need to know and understand. So we can worship with passion our God who is worthy. Now, W stands for worthiness of God. In Psalms 145, verse 3, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Amen. Hallelujah. So we praise God because God is worthy to be praised. He is worthy. If you see God as worthy, then you will worship Him with passion. You will give Him lavish worship from the heart because you knew, you know that God is worthy. Amen. And the little O stands for oneness of God. When we worship, we acknowledge that there is no other God but the God who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Amen. We worship one God, the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. So when we worship, we worship Him alone, the one God. Hallelujah. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, 21, also say, He is the one you praise. Amen. He is the one you praise. Hallelujah. You know, He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Hallelujah. Amen. So when you see God as one God and there's no other God, hallelujah, then we worship Him with passion. The R stands for reality of God. Now, when we worship God, we acknowledge, you know, His reality. God is real. Amen. No doubt God exists. He exists. Our worship is not in vain because God is receiving our adoration. Hallelujah. Praise God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 25 to 25, says there, But if you prophesy, preaching God's word, even though such preaching is mostly for believers and an unsaved person, or a new Christian comes in who does not understand about these things, all these sermons will convince him of the fact that he is a sinner and his conscience you know, will be pricked by everything he hears. As he listens, his secret thoughts will be laid bare and he will fall down on his knees and worship God, declaring that God is really there 
among you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's true, church. You know, it is also experience that we worship God. Hallelujah. The reality of God is at the needs of God. For God inhabits the praises of, of His people. And when, you know, unbelievers or visitors or friends for the first time they come and attend, they will sense a different sensation, a different vibe, you know. They feel the presence of God. They say, God is here. Amen. Hallelujah. S stands for superior, superiority of God. When we worship God, we acknowledge that God is superior. Amen. That there is none like Him. That He is above all things. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. You know, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So He became as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is superior to to theirs. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So when we see God as superior, number one, amen, on the top, hallelujah, you know, then we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now remember the meaning of proskuneo? It is used of the ancient tradition of a person kissing the hand of a superior, right? A person would bow the head and kiss the hand of one who was superior to him. So when we see God as superior, you know, in worship, we do this cross koneu. You know, we kiss toward, we bow down to God to acknowledge His sovereignty and His superiority. Amen. H stands for holiness of God. When we worship God, we acknowledge His holiness, right? First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. We worship Him because He's superior. Amen. Praise God. I stands for immutability of God. The meaning of immutability is unchanging through time. Amen. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our God never changes. When we worship God, we acknowledge His unchanging nature. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. And the peace stands for a powerful God. Do you see Him as a powerful God? When we worship God, we acknowledge that He is the omnipotent God. Amen. All-powerful God. There is no other God. There is no other powerful God but Him alone. Psalm 62 verse 11 to 12 says, One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God. Hallelujah. And with you, Lord, is an Fading love, and you reward everyone according to what they have done. Amen. Power belongs to God. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So your definition of worship depends upon the way you see God and the way you experience Him. It is a matter of the heart and not based on merely human rules. As I said, how you see God will influence the way you worship Him. Do you see Him worthy of worship? Do you see Him as the one true God? Do you see His reality? Do you see Him as superior? Do you see Him in His holiness? Do you see Him as immutable? And do you see Him as a powerful God? If you see all these qualities in God, then you will worship Him with Passion, not based on merely human rules that you have been taught, but from a heart that's been changed by the grace of God. Hallelujah. From a heart that experienced who God is. And you know what, church? If we worship God with passion, and if God is pleased, and if God is glorified, then in the response to worship, God promised in Exodus chapter 23 to 5 to I want you church to take note of this. Hallelujah. This is powerful. Worship the Lord your God, and His blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. 
and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. You know, I believe this truth, this verse, is for us today. As we persevere until we see God's deliverance from this pandemic, let us remain faithful in worshiping God with passion and he promised that blessing will be on our food and water he will take sickness from among us he will make our land fruitful and give us a full lifespan amen therefore church i encourage you today instead of focusing on the negative things that is going on right now around us the things we hear the things we see you know the things we feel negatively let us let us worship god with all of our strength instead minds and hearts and claim what he promised today. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So church, let us grow in our worship expression to God. Amen. You know, with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, with a clear, right, I mean, with the right definition, you know, and understanding, we can worship God with passion. Let's worship him today. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will continue to open our eyes of understanding and speak to us and teach us, Lord, hallelujah, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father God, it is clear that you are seeking a worshiper that will worship you in spirit and truth, dear God. I pray that even right now in the midst of this pandemic, dear God, it seems like still, Lord, causing some, you know, uh, negative effects, you know, and, and all these things going around us, Father God, I pray that we will think of worship, that we will not allow these happenings around us, of oh God, distract us, Lord, to give you worship with passion. So I pray, Lord, hallelujah, that the Holy Spirit will truly anoint us when we gather together as a congregation or as a person or as, as, as a family, Lord, to worship you, Father God. I pray that is from the heart because worship from the heart pleases you, O oh God. And so this morning, in Jesus' name, we claim your promise, Lord, that as we worship, our, as we worship in our God, you will bless our food and water. Amen. You will make this land fruitful. Hallelujah. You will remove sickness from among us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And Lord, tonight and this morning also, God, thank you, Father God, that you promise us for a, a full lifespan. In the name of Jesus, even those who are sick in bed right now, let them worship you, Lord. Amen. Let the worship arise, O Lord, hallelujah, from their hearts to your throne, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray if somebody here today, Lord, are sick in body, O God, I pray in Jesus' name, let there be healing, O God, be upon them. In the name of Jesus, let them receive healing, O God, and deliverance from sickness. Lord, you promise us, O God, that as we worship you, Lord, you will remove sickness from among us, O God. And so today, in the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah, Lord, we pray for your people. I pray for your people, O God, in Jesus' name. Today, Lord, whatever be their situation, whatever be, Lord, uh, the condition of their lives, Lord, whatever be they need, Lord, today, in Jesus' name, you have the promise of God that you will supply our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God, comfort your people. Amen. Give them peace, Lord, that you are our Jehovah Jireh. And even right now, in times like these, you will never abandon us, O God, but supply us accordingly. Thank you, God, for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So, church, let's focus on worshiping God. I know it's difficult times. I myself, you know, experience you know, the pressure, the stress. And, you know, sometimes we get worried. Sometimes we are so anxious about what's going to happen, you know, financially, emotionally, physically, and all these things, you know. We're scared of what's going on. We're scared of going on and stuff like that. But yet we can trust God. Let's just worship Him and claim His promise today that He will bless us in response to worship. God bless everyone, and please take care.